This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. It is Friday, which means we have discussed Super Bowl 57 from every angle possible, which means it's time to focus on something else because Saturday we've got a loaded slate once again of some men's college basketball. So John Rostin is swinging by today to break down his thoughts on a couple of those games, which one he has Zion, and also talk about the general landscape across the nation as we enter some key games in conference play. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim. Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com. Joined here as mentioned by John Rothstein. Check him out on Twitter at John Rothstein. Well, he is an insider for CBS Sports. You can find his podcast, the College Hoops Today podcast as well. John, big weekend coming up for you. How are you doing today? Never better, Jim. Great to be with you. Absolutely. Great to be with you here as well. Just talk about something else other than uh, the Super Bowl. Any uh, Super Bowl predictions for you, John, uh, before we uh, dive into college basketball? You know, I'm hosting a party. I know it's the Chiefs and the Eagles. I'm going to make sure there's wings. I'm going to make sure there's pizza. But other than that, I'm much more interested in Sunday's game between Northwestern and Purdue at Welsh Ryan Arena, to be candid with you. You had Chris Collins on your podcast two weeks ago, uh, head coach of my alma mater. So I'm pretty excited about that one, too. Uh, What you got for me with the Wildcats on Sunday? Well, you know, one of the great stories in college basketball is unfolding in Evanston. And, you know, I think when you look at what transpired at the conclusion of last season, you know, Pete Nance opting to transfer to North Carolina, Ryan Young opting to transfer to Duke. I don't think there's anybody, including myself, that would have felt that Northwestern would have had a chance to finish in the top half of the Big Ten. But we're here now and Northwestern is in position to be in position to make the NCAA tournament for the second time in program history. And look, I firmly believe, you know, that Matt Painter has obviously done a great job at Purdue. He's obviously got two freshman guards. They're number one in the country. They're surging towards a number one seed. But if Northwestern makes the NCAA tournament for the second time in program history and loses a starting big man to North Carolina and a starting big man to Duke, I firmly believe that Chris Collins should be the Big Ten Coach of the Year. Yeah, I still remember where I was when Derek Parton hit that game winner uh, against Michigan back in 2016 or whatever it was. I was in my apartment in Boston uh, watching that. Uh, My my now wife and I went nuts on the couch. It was it was a great time. So hope we can duplicate that. Purdue, pretty tough task, uh, but. They've been Very playing simple. well so far. So, you know, it's, it's been a blast. We're going to talk about some bubble teams. I know Northwestern is in your uh, your 68 right now. We'll talk mm-hmm. about that. Other bubble teams may rise and more in a second. But first, a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. You get all that Super Bowl 57 breakdown. We talked props. We talked the game. We talked about anthem halftime all that all in the same place just search for covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts hit subscribe and if you like what you hear leave us a rating and review as well now talking about purdue let's talk about some teams at the top of the nation and john i think that this this year there's a lack of consensus around which team is the best in the nation and that seems a bit odd when you're looking back at like past years when's the last time you remember I'm going to call it parody at the top. You know, you can say no team is separated. I'll call it parody. When is the last time a year similar to this occurred in your mind? You know, Jim, this really reminds me of the 2010-11 season when UConn won the national championship but was 9-9 and in Big East play. And you think about the makeup of that Final Four. You had UConn a three seed, Kentucky a four seed. And on the other side of the bracket, it was VCU an 11 and Butler an eight. I don't know if we're going to have that type of discrepancy in terms of who makes the final four. But if you told me there's going to be no one or two seeds in the final four in Houston on April 1st, I wouldn't be shocked. No, I think that that makes a lot of sense because there can be chaos. There's volatility and stuff like that when there is a lack of consensus and that can lead to a lot of fun stuff in March. So let's take a look at the top of the nation right now. I want to know for you, John, when you look at the best teams in the nation, which team do you pinpoint as being the one Maybe not that wins a national championship because there is a lot of volatility there. But if you were picking the best team right now, which team are you focusing on there? I don't have a best team. And I know that's, <laughs> I not, a, that's not a cop out answer, but I, I don't I see flaws everywhere. I mean, Purdue is the team that I think has played the best against the highest caliber of competition. 
in terms of their performance. But when you look at Purdue and you think about what has won in the NCAA tournament, part of the equation for all the teams that go to the Final Four and make and win national championships is elite guard play. Think about last year's you know that perimeter for Kansas: Remy Martin, Ochai Baji, Dewan Harris, Christian Brown. Then think about the year before with Baylor, Adam Flagler, Macy O.T., Davion Mitchell, Jared Butler. Think about Virginia in 2019, Ty Jerome, Kyle Guy, Kihei Clark, DeAndre Hunter. Those are the perimeters that have won national championships over the last couple of NCAA tournaments. We are now asking Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer to join that exclusive company. That's something that I think is a little bit alarming. I think if Purdue runs against Obviously, you know, a team that has great athleticism can double the post and obviously get into their guards. We saw it last night. Iowa, at the end of the game, frustrated Purdue with the pressure, and there was a lot of turnovers down the stretch. And here's another thing, and you know me, I always like to look at things from 30,000 feet out. Purdue is now trending towards being the number one seed in the South region. If that holds... Purdue then would play a regional final and a Sweet 16 at the KFC Yum Center in Louisville. That is the same site of the Elite Eight loss to Virginia in 2019. Jim, it's just a little bit of history repeating. Absolutely. And I think that another, another like ding against Purdue, at least in my eyes, is like, the conference has been underwhelming on the whole. Mm. I mean, Purdue has been a difference in that. Like, they had not been underwhelming. But it seems like the Big Ten in general isn't the strength isn't the conference as strong a conference as we typically see? Have you had a similar perception of the conference in general uh, with the Big Ten? We can't argue the volume of the Big Ten. We can't argue what the Big Ten has done in terms of putting teams into the NCAA tournament. But remember this. The Big Ten earned 18 bids over the last two NCAA tournaments and only sent three teams to the Sweet 16 in the last two years. Michigan went twice and Purdue went once. Other than the Boilers, I think you look at Indiana, you look at Rutgers as teams that could get to that second weekend. But after that, we're splitting Adams. All depends on the matchups. But Jim, as you know, as well as I do, this is only February. Absolutely. So a lot to be decided. So let's talk about some teams that could be on the rise here because there is still some time before we get to the conference tournaments and stuff like that. When you're looking at the the non-top teams, you know, beyond that upper tier we were just discussing, which teams do you think could rise and really make some noise when the games matter as we get into the conference tournaments? You know, I look at what team could be this year's North Carolina, be a team that's in the middle of the bracket and then make a run deep into the field. And I think Creighton has all the requisites. Creighton is a team, again, that was a bit, you know, off the radar because of Ryan Kalkbrenner's illness in late December, but has regained its form, has a starting five that can match up with anybody in college basketball, has gotten great play out of South Dakota State transfer Baylor Shireman. He's having a better rebounding season this year at Creighton than he did last year at South Dakota State. Creighton's a team, I think, that could be this year's North Carolina. Yeah, and that's uh, an interesting team for sure, and see who can make some noise there, maybe don't get a higher seed because of the underperformance earlier on this year. Cause aggregate record does go into a lot of that stuff. So that could uh, make them a fun team to focus on later on. Now that's focusing on March, focusing on the conference tournaments, but we still have regular season championships left to be decided. So when you look at the regular season conference championships that are still up in the air, John, which races are you watching and how do you see those races playing out? Well, the UCLA and Arizona are obviously neck and neck in the Pac-12. That's a really interesting race to watch. I think the Mountain West, again, has been one of the most compelling conferences in college basketball. There's a real chance for this league to get four teams in the NCAA tournament again. And then the Big East with Xavier. You know, I think we talked the last time about the Musketeers that I was on with you. Recalibrated under Sean Miller and, again, still looking formidable Obviously, without Zach Fremantle, Jerome Hunter is playing more at the four. Colby Jones is playing a little small ball four. They play on Friday night against Butler at Hinkle Fieldhouse. But Xavier, again, to me, aesthetically pleasing and maybe the best watch in college basketball. Xavier right now, not the favorite in the Big East. You got Marquette at plus 130, Xavier plus 170, Creighton, who you mentioned before, also plus 280. When you look at those three teams, do you think that Xavier has the juice to pull this out in the regular season? And then once we get to uh, conference tournament play, how do you see this, this conference all shaking out? 
Well, I think the teams that we're looking at right now are all the class of the Big East. Those teams are clearly going to be in the NCAA tournament. I had Seton Hall on Friday as one of my first four teams out on my bracket breakdown, obviously, for FanDuel. But I think when you look at this league and you think about what's going to happen down the stretch, Xavier still has a road game at Providence. Xavier still has a road game at Marquette. Xavier still has a road game at Seton Hall who will view that game as an opportunity to get a quad one victory and solidify their status as an at-large team. So Xavier has quite a bit of difficulty remaining on its non-conference schedule. I give the edge to Marquette, but again, we're splitting Adams again. And again, creating a team that could make some noise once we get to tournament play as well. Now, you mentioned your round of 60 or your your group of 68, your field of 68. You posted that this morning over on the duel. So we know who the bubble teams are. We know which teams are kind of on the fringes at the moment. When you look at those teams, whether they be on the good side of the bubble right now or the wrong side, looking at the next couple of weeks, John, which teams do you think are going to solidify themselves as being teams that cement themselves in the tournament over the next couple of weeks? You know, Wisconsin had a great win against Penn State the other night in State College. Wisconsin's turning a corner. And again, when you're in a conference like the Big Ten or the Big 12, you are going to get opportunities to move the needle. That obviously benefits the teams in those conferences. Yeah, uh, Wisconsin, a team that... um... It's been interesting for sure. Uh, we'll see what they can do as far as trying to ascend towards the bubble. Any other teams you're you have your eyes on as far as ones that you think are going to you know really cement themselves in the next couple of weeks? Oregon's got an opportunity to get a quad one win on Saturday against UCLA. That's a big opportunity for the Ducks. And I also think you know the Texas A and M because of what happened last year, just missing missing out on the bracket is an interesting team to follow. The one thing we have to keep an eye on with Texas A&M, Texas A&M has a pair of quad four losses on its resume. They lost, obviously, to Wofford at home. They lost to Murray State on a neutral court. Those two losses will follow them around like a 10-pound dumbbell on their ankle from now until Selection Sunday. Absolutely. Now, you alluded to some big games coming up this weekend. Let's take a look at Saturday's slate of games, John. When you look at all those games, if you're making like a must-watch list for someone who is watching college basketball on Saturday, which games to you crack that must-watch list? UConn Creighton is appointment television. Sonogo, Kalkbrenner, Hurley, McDermott. Obviously, Creighton is such a tough team to beat at home. A great matchup, too, at the point guard spot between Ryan Newton and Ryan Nemhard and Tristan Newton, who's playing outstanding basketball. Virginia against Duke. Can Duke solidify its status as a real, real contender? to make noise, obviously, down the stretch in the ACC. Then I think every single Big 12 game, as always, is going to be one that's, you know, we're going to be looking at, obviously, really, really closely. TCU limping a little bit without Mike Miles. How do they match up with Baylor? And I think Baylor is built for the NCAA tournament. I look at this Baylor team, and I think about their makeup. And it's really similar to the makeup that they had when they won a national championship in 2021. And let's go through it for a sec. Who were the fives in 2021? Chamo Chichua and Flo Thamba. They have them, and they also have Josh Andrinwana, who I think is a terrific, terrific prospect long-term. The four on that team was Mark Vital. Great defender. Jalen Bridges is obviously a little bit different, but you still have a capable foreman. And then the guards on that team were Teague, Mitchell, and Butler, the cards on this team are Flagler, Cryer, and George. So you got the same five men, you have another elite perimeter, and you got a four man who's a borderline all conference player. So, what do you view as being the ceiling for Baylor? Uh, you know, they're 17 to 1 within a national championship right now. They are not in that upper tier, but as we said, there's a lot of ambiguity there. Do you think they, they have the upside to do that again? Or is this more so just a team that is going to be making noise, maybe not having the ceiling to win at all? Now, Baylor can go to the Final Four again and win a national championship. I have no doubt about that. All righty. Baylor 17-1 to right now to win the national championship. Over at FanDuel Sportsbook, their odds to advance to the Final Four are plus 350 as well. That is John Rothstein. Once again, check him out on Twitter, at John Rothstein. Find him over at CBS Sports and the on the College Hoops Today podcast. John, have fun this weekend. Enjoy the games. Enjoy um, Northwestern versus Purdue on Sunday as well. We'll talk to you once again here soon. Jim, always great to be with you. Sorry about the cough, but you know, as you know, we sleep in May. 
We sleep in May. We uh, we we have cough drops in May as well. That is John Rothstein. Thank you, John, as always. Uh, John Rothstein doing a great job as always. Welcome back on here again as we get closer to March as well to talk about whether it be the conference tournaments or the NCAA tournament. As mentioned, if you want to see his field of 68 as it stands right now, that is up over on The Duel. So search for that or just check his Twitter as well. You can find that over there. Get a piece of $10 million in bonus bets with FanDuel's Kick of Destiny. All you have to do is bet $5 on Super Bowl 57. And if Gronk kicks a field goal live during the game, you'll get a piece of $10 million in bonus bets. It doesn't matter if you're new to FanDuel or already have an account. Gronk Kick, you win. It's as simple as that. So don't miss out on the FanDuel Kick of Destiny, America's number one sports book. Make every moment worth FanDuel official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Must be 21 plus in select states. Minimum of $5 wager required. Award may vary. Minimum $5. Projected max $20. Bonus award issued is non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in seven days. All participants are eligible for the bonus award. Restrictions apply. See full terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Or visit FanDuel.com slash RG. In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777. Or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Maryland and Wyoming, or in Kansas and Wyoming, 1-800-522-4700. In Kansas, ksgamblinghelp.com. Louisiana, one 877 770 stop in Maryland, mdgamblinghelp.org in West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.net in New York, 1-877-A-HOPE-NY or text HOPE and Y. That is all that we have here for this week on covering the spread. It's been a blast. I want to thank all of our guests we had on throughout this week. We had Joe Ostrowski. Check him out on Twitter at Joe Ostrowski. We had uh, Ryan Williams, Ryan Alexander underscore W, Pamela Maldonado, Pamela M35, JJ Zach Reason at late round QB, and John Rothstein getting a set for what should be a fantastic weekend of betting. But as always, it doesn't stop there. Next week, we'll be breaking down I'm going to go through my takeaways of betting the NFL this year, what I learned, uh, what I'm taking into 2023, recapping the Super Bowl as well, obviously, on there. We'll talk uh, some NHL. We'll talk some PGA. We're going to preview the Daytona 500 on Wednesday. So a lot of good stuff still coming your way. If you want to check out those past episodes about the Super Bowl or check out next week's shows, make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Hit subscribe. And if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. And as always, all these shows do go up on the FanDuel YouTube page as well. That's all that we got here for today, though. Have a fantastic weekend. Be safe. Have fun, bet responsibly, and enjoy Super Bowl 57, men's college basketball, and anything else you're betting this weekend. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.